I've come to take you home. I've come to take you home. Home. Remember the felt, the lush green grass beneath the big oak trees. The air is cool there, and the sun does not burn. The story of Sarah Bartman, an indigenous Khoi Khoi woman who was taken from her country of birth in 1810 and paraded on European stages as part of a freak show, became a catalyst for the revival of Hoi dignity and pride. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buhu and mint. She died a lonely death in Paris in 1816, and her body parts were kept in jars in the museum. After lengthy negotiations with the French government, the remains of Sarah were brought back in 2002 to be buried in her ancestral home. Sarah Bartman gave us as women a spiritual connectedness that we did not know existed. And to me that is so positive. The fact that to us she became the icon of our spiritual connectedness. It was time for the rebirth of Khoi Khoi identity, a people until recently described as extinct. This is the story of Sarah Bartman and her people, the Khoi Khoi herders of Southern Africa. <laughs> Around the time of the birth of Christ, Khoi Khoi herders lived in territories all along the Cape Coast, as far east as the Great Fish River and northwest across the Kharib or Orange River. They lived here with large flocks of fat-tailed sheep with luxurious pastures bringing stability and wealth until a new force arrived, not from the interior of Africa, but from a people that came from a distant and completely different civilization. The pre-colonial history of the Hoi Hoi is not easy to tell because there are no written records except for rock art and archaeological remains. As historians, we are challenged by trying to recreate a very distant past, the past of the 17th and 18th century. Largely, we base our evidence on records which were generated and written by officials of the Dutch East India Company. So right from the start, one must be aware that there is, of course, an, a bias in these records. These bias reflect the official view of the VOC, or the Dutch East India Company. The history is written by the conquerors, um, and that is how we got our own history. The victors, the conquerors, the colonialists wrote the history from their perspective, never from the perspective of the people who were on the land. And that colored our whole approach to history in South Africa. 
In this film, we are bringing a fresh perspective and a new narrative using oral records, archaeological evidence, and re examining the old diaries and reports for clues to the truth. Archaeological evidence suggests that the Hoi Hoi arrived in the Cape about 2,000 years ago. But where did they come from? For many years, historians were puzzled by their origin, and there were many theories. The research around the origin of the Khoi Khoi has been going on for many, many years. Archaeologists, uh, historians, linguists, anthropologists, and geneticists became involved. The geneticists have set up a genetic tree of humankind with all these branches. The lowest branch, in other words, the oldest branch, and a sub-branch of that branch is called the LOD, and that is the oldest example of humanity, and that's where the Khoi belong, and also the Bushmen in this country. Because of the migration history and the development of Khoi as such, when they intermingled with the Bushmen in northern Botswana and eventually down, they actually share, do the Khoi and the Bushmen, a common gene pool. If you look at the genome of a descendant of either of those people, you'll find their similarities. One of the richest archaeological sites is found off the Cape's west coast, just north of Saldana Bay, at a place called Castelberg. We found very good evidence of groups living on the Friedenberg Peninsula on the west coast, the site of Kastilbach. And Kastilbach was occupied between probably around 1800 years ago until about 800 years ago. For a thousand years, people came back seasonally. In fact, it is the richest site we know of the Khoi. And one reason we found it is because they were living on the coast and collecting shellfish. We've only found one skeleton at Kastilberg. It was a young girl. She was from the south. She has a Cape signature. The northern groups in the Kalahari had different DNA to those living in the Cape. North of Kastilberg, at a place called Forescop, we've got DNA which relates to DNA from northern Malawi. We've got the connection of the Khoi with Tanzania. There's a group called the Sandawi, who are clique speakers, who are also probably connected genetically to people of the Cape. People coming in from the north probably took local wives. Centuries ago, there was not that wave, but rather very, very lengthy movement of different groups of pastoralists who were once upon a time hunter-gatherers. The main reason for migration is that as the communities grew, became bigger, they looked for new pasture, they would hive off, they would be become a split. So a senior son of the chief would move, move off with one clan and then go and establish in a new area. But this took time over hundreds and hundreds of years. It wasn't a sudden track that everybody packed up and now we're migrating south. This is the same method that the indigenous people used a long time ago. Similar structures, sometimes it can be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. It all depends on the group also and the availability of material. And the match, it was very practical, as you can roll up and it will take you about two hours, even less if you know the skill, less than two hours to construct something like this. This is where the mighty Harib and the Fowl River come together. It is thought that it is somewhere here that the Khoi Khoi herders crossed and then followed the Siakui River south into the Karoo. A fairly acceptable theory is that they came down the Siakui River because that part of the Karoo is quite arid, it's very dry, but the Siakui River was a kind of corridor south. It is here, in the heart of the Cape Karoo, 
that we find evidence of the presence of Khoi Khoin herders. Ons is so 50 kilometers north van Bouverwes, op die dorpie Nelspoort. En ons is hier in die galerij, wat geskip is dier die san en die kooi. Nou wat ons hier het op die klip is typische tekeninge of grafiere van die kooi mense. En hulle teken al dit in cirkelvormige, cirkelvormige figure. Hier is een prachtige tekening met een cirkel met uitgekerfde patrone. Hulle het gedoen natuurlijk met klip. Dit is symbolies van aarde, dit is meestal son of cirkelvormige uitgegrafeerde prente op die klip. Drawings similar to those can be found all over southern Africa and also here in the south of Namakoland in the area known as the Kners Vlakte. Die oorals op die klippe en aardes is daar grafering wat ge- gemaakt is en is duidelijk dat die, die grafering dier die my voorouwers die kooi kooi en die san gemaakt is. Baie van hierdie graferings is aanduidings dat het moendlik presente was wat in, 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 in tye van, van die hokmeisie aan die meisies oorhandig is soos die uh, velsakke krale en dan is daar ook moendlike teke uh, graferings wat lyk soos slange wat direk hou verband hou met die hokmeisie want die hokmeisie gaan het ook oor die waterslang wat in hierdie sir, r- ritueel ge- gebruik is. After crossing the Cape Mountains, they reached the east coast. One group continued east as far as the Fish River. Others continued west until they reached the Cape. Some even continued into the Northern Cape. Archaeological evidence proves that the Khoi Khoi lived around the Cape coastal belt 1,800 years ago. The pre-colonial period offers us very little written information about the Khoi Khoi. Shell middens, such as this, however, provide us with a picture about the lifestyle of these early inhabitants. Shell middens are like ancient household rubbish dumps, and what we throw away says a lot about us. From this midden, we can see what the Khoi Khoi ate, the tools they used, and how they stored their food and their water. We had Stol Bay, and the mouth of the Gaukau River is almost just a kilometer or so away from us. But all along the shore, you have these interesting patterns, sort of rocks arranged in semicircles or half circles, if you like. Now, these were built many, many years ago by the early Khoi Khoi of this area, and they're called fish traps. Professor Michael de Jong spent many years studying one of the groups along the South Cape coastline near Swellendam, the Khoi Khoi Hesekwas, and made some interesting discoveries. We sampled over 160 people and found that the fingerprint, the DNA fingerprint of Koi was definitely there. We went back literally to each individual and gave them personal confidential feedback in terms of their genetic profile. The dominating percentage was Khoi Khoi. Today, all Khoi Khoi descendants are classified as colored, a political move by the colonial and apartheid governments effectively stripping Khoi Khoi descendants of any claims to land by changing their name and cutting them from their native roots. In 1904, the census shows that 
the Nama, the Korana, the Damara, the Cape Koi, around about 96,000 are recorded in the census as Hottentot. And then there's another column in the census where they say mixed or other, and that's around 300,000. The following census takes place in 1911, when the Union of South Africa is now in place. Suddenly there is no more a column of Hottentot or Khoi people. There's only a column called Coloured. So if we come up to today and we extrapolate on those figures, around about at least 1, 1.2 million people classified as Coloured are Khoi. This note to census officials in 1898 states, there are very few purebred of the Hottentot race and persons should not be classed as Hottentots unless the distinctive characteristics of that race predominate. Long before the Dutch came and established the Cape Refreshment Station, local Khoi Khoi were interacting with European seafarers who used the Cape as a port to take in fresh water and meat supplies. Misunderstandings often led to conflict and death. In 1510, the Viceroy of Portuguese India, Francesca de Almeida, on his return to Europe, anchored in Table Bay for trade. Following an altercation over cattle, the Portuguese sailors attacked a kraal and seized a number of children and cattle. Approximately 170 Khoi Khoi warriors fought back with stones and assegais, killing 64 of them, including Almeida and 11 of his captains. We of course tell it from the perspective of the fact that it was a victory against colonialism. Unfortunately, we kept the, the Portuguese away for 100 years, but that paved the way for the English and the Dutch to start calling here. For the Khoi Khoi clans that lived on the shores of Table Bay, it meant good business. It was 1,071 ships on the outward bound journey alone from Europe stopping at the Cape between 1600 and 1652. Some 200,000 people passed through the Cape at Table Bay before Van Riebeek. The Dutch and the French and the British and the Portuguese and the Danes, their ships were battered, they needed timber, they needed salt, they needed meat. They would stop off in the Cape for anything between three weeks and nine months. So in this period of 50 years before Van Riebeek, there was a huge traffic. The indigenous people were quite used to foreigners coming along. And indeed, what happened in 1613 was that a indigenous man by the name of Hore was kidnapped together with another guy and they were taken to England. What the English idea was that they wanted to create a small colony. Hore was taught English and they wanted Hore to be their point man. But this plan backfired when Khori, after his return to the Cape, demanded more for their meat. Khori saw the value that the British placed on these commodities that they were parting with for very little beforehand. I mean, it was they were selling a, a cattle for pieces of copper wire and shiny trinkets. And obviously, when he realized the economic value of the cattle that the Khoi possessed, you know, in terms of the European concept of value, he obviously upped his prices. Long after Tore, Aujumao, who travelled with the English to Batavia, became their point man in Table Bay next to the mouth of the river they called Kamisa or Sweet Water. Now Van Riebeek himself in his diaries, he says that Aujumao uh, would have that he was the founder of the incipient trade at the, uh, 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 at the Cape. So there was no doubt about it that the claim had been made by Archimao that he was the founder of the port of Cape Town and that his community were the servicing community for those ships. But in 1647, a seemingly insignificant event would indirectly lead to a major shift in the fortunes of not only the Cape Khoi Khoi, 
but for the entire indigenous population and changed the course of history for Southern Africa. On 25 March 1647, the Dutch Indiaman Dinive Harlem ran aground in Table Bay. At first, the shipwreck seemed much less dramatic than the countless vessels that had run aground before it. However, this event was destined to change the course of history. The Dutch ship the Harlem ran aground somewhere around here in 1647. Now recently, researchers have found evidence of it trapped underneath these dunes and they're looking to unearth it. Check there, there was also a metal concentration there. And in the meantime, we'll go and check the deeper part. Okay. Marine archaeologist Dr. Bruno Vers is determined to find the wreck of the Harlem, believed to be buried here on Dolphin Beach. I demarcated an area of coastline where I assumed that the Harlem must have found it. Support for that was given by a manuscript map that is currently in the Dutch State Archives and that shows a direct line drawn from the old fort of Riebeek across the bay at this approximate location. The length of the line has been stated as one and a half Dutch miles and that uh, results in a distance of about 11.4 kilometers. And that is exactly the area where we are standing in now. Now, 62 of the crewmen managed to, for a full year, survive in these dunes. A fact that influenced the Dutch decision to establish a permanent refreshment station at the Cape in 1652. On 6 April 1652, Jan van Riebeck arrives with a fleet of three ships. His orders were explicitly not to establish a colony, but a fortified trading station. And they built a fort right over there. Because at that stage, that was the beachfront. I'm currently standing on the Grand Parade. My earliest memory of the Grand Parade is my mother holding my hand as she took me to my ballet exams just up that street. Later, the fort was replaced by a more permanent structure, the Cape Castle, just over there. Van Riebeek came and he built his fort right on top of Achamawa's small settlement next to the river and then he dammed the river so that they strategically controlled the most important resource. And this pattern starts to unfold for the next 180 years where water is constantly being seized along with land and dispossession is happening. I don't think the VOC wanted to really remain here in the first years of the colony. After all of this to and froing with regards to correspondence between Van Riebeek and the, and the VOC, he finally convinced them in 1656 to permit him to grant land to those Dutch who had families at the Cape. Now this resulted in the decree of the 16th of May, 1656. During the Cape winter of 1657, while the Hoi Hoi moved with their herds to the warmer regions, free burghers moved onto farms along the fertile Liesbeek River. The Peninsula Khoi Khoi lost their land, primarily as a result of the invasion by the Freeburgers along the Lisbeek River, where present Rondebos is and. After that, they were not permitted to live any longer in the, what we know today as the Table Bay Basin. Van Riebeck wrote, the Khoi Khoi leaders were not entirely pleased. He states, but it was evident that it was not entirely to their liking. This is Rondebosch, where the first farms were handed over to the Freeburgers. It's also the site of the first skirmishes between the Khoi Khoi and the Dutch over grazing land and water. Unfortunately, there is no evidence as to what really took place here during that part of our history. The first agricultural enterprises essentially was on land that was taken from the Khoisan and granted to Freeburgers without the Khoisan's permission, but by decree by the VOC. People who were sitting in Amsterdam, you know, that doesn't even know what the Cape looked like. 
This is the Lisbic River, along which those first farms were. Jan van Riebeek built a fence from the mouth of the river all the way to Kirstenbosch, blocking the Khoi Khoi from the river and protecting their settlements. That fence essentially became South Africa's first boundary, separating black and white, almost symbolizing apartheid. In his diary, Jan van Riebeek wrote, and everything will be well protected against raids by the Hottentots. The Khorinaikwa, when they arrived back here, I mean, to, to find their grazing lands being fenced off, this must have been a huge blow to the Khoisan, to see this happening you know, by these, these visitors, these people that they thought were not going to be here forever. This resulted in what we know today as the first Khoi Dutch War of 1659-1660. It was in fact the first war of resistance in this country. It has to be seen in that context. The Khoi Khoi were not naive to think that they could overthrow the Dutch. Remember the Dutch had muskets, they had guns, they had cannon. The Khoi Khoi had fire-hardened sticks, they had bows and arrows, they had spears, and I mean, the depiction of Doman with a spear in his hand was essentially his image as the first guerrilla fighter in this country. People's concept of war is different, right? But in the, in this, in the context of this particular war, it was more a series of guerrilla attacks on the Dutch. In 1672, the Dutch tricked two Khoi Khoi leaders, who had no authority, into signing away the whole Cape, all the way to Saldana and the Hottentots Holland to the east. This is a photograph of the original document. It's stated specifically the land bought by the Dutch in 1672 included the Cape Peninsula, Hottentots, Holland, Falls Bay, and Saldana. And the Dutch tried to prove by that document this land belonged to white colonists under the rule of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. Obviously, we cannot accept that. It was nothing else but the old co-option tokenism that took place there. And what's more, in terms of your intention, which the law requires you to, 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 to have a full understanding of what you are signing, they could not have had the same understanding of the legal philosophy of the Dutch. The Khoi people had a completely different concept of ownership. They believed that in the first instance, God created land. And it totally clashed with the colonizers, the Europeans' world view regarding land. And because it, it's a divine gift, it was not up to the chief or the community to give it away. So all the treaties that have been signed during the colonial eras, both in the Dutch colonial era and the, the later English colonials, was, uh, were actually null and void. One of Jan van Riebeck's trusted interpreters was a young woman, Kratoa, or Eva, as he called her. She was Ochimao's niece, and as far as we know, the first indigenous woman to marry a European. At the age of 10, 11, she is recruited from the community by Jan van Riebeek's wife. It clearly states in Van Riebeek's diary that she came into the service of my wife. And then secondly, 
The kind of clothes that she wore were not European clothes. They were clothes associated with East Asian slaves. So she was a servant. By the time she's sort of 15, 16, she's being used for interpretation, um, for diplomacy work. Kritoa was using her position for the benefit of her people at times, and not just for herself and not just for Van Ribbeek. After her husband died during an expedition, Kratoa became an outcast amongst her own people who believed that she had sold them out. And without her husband and the support of Van Riebeck, who had gone back to Holland, she was no longer welcomed in the Cape Dutch community. And now say Kratoa, O oh, my koi son sleeping skin, but grow in my now. But sing my no, Sam it goes. Here on the top of the point, sing Sam at my, my ayah gratuas manalit. And in it, lift it. Oh, dear. Here on the top. We're here at the Castle of Good Hope, where on this day in 1674, Kratoa Iafa passed away on Robben Island and was buried here, right where this bench is. A few years later, her remains were exhumed and taken just up the road to the Enchia Kerk, where she now rests. Controversially, Khoisan descendants feel that this bench is an inappropriate and insulting way, an undignified way in which to honor this mother of the nation. She should be revered. The statues should be not only on Robben Island, outside of the castle, all over. Kratoa's name should have been echoing within our communities. I'll now read to you the diary entry for the castle for exactly that day. The 29th of July, 1674. How changeable this African climate is. The west wind, which had by its violence caused a boisterous sea and during the last two days had threatened everything with destruction, had today gone down completely, followed by such calm weather that not the slightest motion could be observed in the air, whilst the bay was as smooth and bright as a mirror. This day departed this life. A certain Hottentou named Irfa, long ago taken from the African brood in her tender childhood. Just about 70 kilometers north of Cape Town, we find this beautiful stretch of fertile land. It is known as the Swartland, and in the distance, we see the Riebeck Kasteel Mountain, named after the commander, Jan van Riebeck. When van Riebeck arrived in the Cape, this region stretching all the way to Saldana, and even further, was a home to a cattle-rich and powerful Khoikhoin tribe. They were the largest group really between the peninsula and between the little Namakwa in the northwest. And they would have been a large and semi-nomadic group. According to accounts, they uh, had lots of cattle and they were constantly on the move. So they, they very seldom settled anywhere for more than two or three days. While the Dutch saw an opportunity to trade with a cattle-rich nation, they turned out to be their biggest obstacle to colonial expansion into the interior, and it would lead to a brutal and protracted conflict that lasted for many years. Now, the Kohokwa tribe existed in a sort of a horseshoe pattern around the peninsula. Okay, they had two leaders, or two known leaders, there were actually many more, but the two um, celebrated leaders are, of course, Udesowa, who had his kraal um, on the west coast, close to Saldana Bay, and there was Gonema, or Gonomoa, 
we had this crawl at Goedemans Kloof. Well, it landed up at Goedemans Kloof, but we had various crawls all along the, uh, well, uh, all over the, the Boland region, the main one being at Klapmans. So, the Kohokwa being um, very much larger in number than the Horinaikwa and the Horokokwa prevented further expansion of the colony, essentially just by their presence. But Nkhonomoa was actually the, the deputy chief of the Kohokwa. The Kohokwa's headquarters at that time was near Saldana Bay, and the chief was Odusua. But in 1673, when Nkhonomoa started his war against the VOC, Odusua was already an old guy, and he was quite contented with what he had. He couldn't see the danger and the risks in the VOC's settlement at the Cape. He just couldn't see it because he was rich. He had thousands of cattle and sheep, etc. So he couldn't see the reason why he should fight. 18 July 1673. The Dutch East India Company sends Hieronymus Cruz to attack the Kohokwa. This attack, executed on horseback, marks the beginning of the second Dutch Khoi Khoi War. The second frontier war was more a war fought further away from the Cape Peninsula in the Berg River area of today. After the signing of the land transactions of 1672. Once the Kachokwa lost the war, they, they had to pay sort of an indemnity or, f or fine, or they were basically stripped of a great deal of their livestock. The Dutch basically destroyed the economic independence of what had been this most powerful group. They start encouraging what they call trekboers to move into new lands, and they create a legal instrument for them to do that called um, a grazing license. So they give these, the, these would-be farmers grazing licenses. They move into the koi lands. They, they take the koi's cattle and they seize the watering holes. And then the Dutch East India Company created another legal instrument called uh, a Leonang Platz, a, a loan farm. And the loan farm system is basically saying to white settlers, there's no impediment now on you taking land. There's no one going to stop you from taking land, so you can go and take land. The koi koi aren't going to resist you anymore. They're probably not there in the same numbers anymore. So you can take the land. And the only stipulation is that you pay an annual rental to the company. The principle that was applied for the most part was the terra nullius um, argument. That terra nullius just was not uh, 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 a correct uh, legal doctrine and for a fact the uh, United Nations has denounced that terra nullius as uh, 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 not a legal doctrine that entitled people to come and take other people's land. By the turn of the, of the 18th century already there were 400 farms in possession of, of settler farmers. Some of these farms, um, 10, 20 of them even, owned by one person or in the name of one person. Within 50 years of the arrival of Jan van Riebeck, the Khoi Khoi tribal life and economy, based on livestock and land, disintegrated. For many years, historians attributed this to the smallpox epidemic. Today, modern interpretations of the old historic records have changed the narrative. So you have in the beginning, you have reports that there are anything between 150,000 and 200,000 Khoi people in the Cape. You also have reports from the Europeans that they had tens of thousands of herds of cap cattle, 20 of thousands of herds of sheep. So you had a rich people with a sustainable livelihood who had the land and who had the water and they were probably one of the most successful farming communities in Africa, not just in South Africa. Through colonialism, literally within 50 years, the backbone of this entire economy is suddenly eroded. Now, what we are told by the 
colonial history books is that there was the smallpox epidemic in 1713 and that everybody got wiped out. And that's just absolutely not true. The reports were very much of actual theft and robbery and murder and, and some colonists even went as far as what we would now regard as being the Eastern Cape. And they basically attacked quarry groups and stole their cattle and massacred. It was indeed not a free exchange of commodities. And part of that trade was accompanied by violence. Once the colonists began to expand further into the interior and their farms became more widespread and they needed to defend and protect the cattle that they had stolen or bartered from the Khoi Khoi, uh, you needed a force to, to protect the, the colonists. Dutch used a system that, that, that we now know, known as the commando system, in order to coerce uh, Khoi Khoi people who were still um, trying to hold on to land in their independent tribal forms to get rid of that land or to transfer that land to Dutch, um, into Dutch ownership. It had tragic consequences for us and our free forebears, as well as the present generation in South Africa, that the, that peace treaty of the Cape of Gudo demonstrated Dutch might in the Cape, that finally they lost not only their land, but also the independence. The Dutch East India Company commander Jan van Rieberg first heard from his Kreukroen translator Kratoa about the cattle-rich and powerful tribe that lived just over the mountain. The company was under pressure to find more meat and were looking for other tribes to trade with. In the company journal it is written, a much bigger nation with a greater wealth of stock. Like the rest of the Khoikhoin tribes, the Hasekwas were transhumaned and there were no real boundaries. Roughly, they grazed their herds all along the Sonner End River and in Swellendam all along the Breda River and as far east as the Khoritz River. They had a good relationship with their neighbors, the Khorikwas on the east side and the Khainukwas on the western border and the groups often strayed into each other's territory. Early accounts by travelers and traders were often fragmentary and sometimes even inaccurate. But we do find evidence of the presence of the Khoi Khoi in the names of rivers and places. This is the Hesquas River, and behind me is the Hesquas Kluif. The Hesquas lived in this region, some two kilometers west of Swellendam. This is Mossel Bay Beach on the South Cape coast. It is Khorikwa territory, not Hesekwa, but we start our journey on the Hesekwa here because of its historical significance. To answer some of my questions, I'm going to meet with Professor Michael de Jong, who has done extensive research on the Hesekwa and written this book, A Forgotten First People, the Southern Cape Hesekwa. Professor de Jong, before we start speaking about the Hesekwa, can you tell me a little bit about the first contact between the Khoi Khoi and the Europeans that apparently happened in this area? Yes, this was a particularly significant contact because Bartholomew Diaz came to the shore and stepped mm -hmm. ashore and he saw people here with cattle who had been grazing just above us here and they entertained him and welcomed him in a very friendly manner. This was in 1488. Because the Khoritz River is so close to here, we deduce that they were the Khorikwa. Now Khorikwa or Khorikwa actually means people of the cattle. And they did have cattle. In fact, the early Dutch people called this Khoritz River, which is close to us, the Rio dos Vaqueros, which means the river of the cattle people. 
And people speak about a skirmish here. Was that skirmish between the Chorikwa and the, and the Portuguese? When Diaz landed here, it was a friendly meeting. In fact, they danced and sang a song and said, welcome to us. And they had good relations. But upon returning at the later stage, they came back to this particular spot because there's a spring up here looking for fresh water and there was a misunderstanding. And in fact, there was a skirmish and these sailors had to go back to the little sailing ship very quickly. I think these people who arrived here presumed they can take water, they can help themselves to cattle. I think that might have been the origin because there's a particular custom in terms of how strangers approach people like the Chorikwa, and I don't think they were aware of that. According to the ship's records, Diaz shot and killed one of the Chorikwa with his crossbow. Diaz became the first murderer of a herder at that time. That was when Bartolomeus Diaz arrived at Mossel Bay. The cattle post at Reed Fillet, just outside Swellendam, became an important trading stop. At first, the Hesequa were willing traders. The trade link enabled the Cape Governor to supply passing ships with meat on a regular basis. Klaas Dora's name first appears in VOC records when he introduced the Dutch to the Hesequas for trade. Klaas was a Hainuqua captain, and after the death of Suswa, the respected chief of the Hainuquas, Klaas became one of the leaders. His kraal was here, not far from Grabo, and for 20 years, he was the important middle man in their trade with the Hesequas. In 1693, things changed, and the governor, Simon van der Stel, suspected Klaas Dora of working against them. They attacked his kraal, arrested him, and confiscated all his livestock. Bas, or Captain Dora, was a man who, who tried his hardest, I suppose, to cooperate or collaborate with, with the company. The futility of, of trying to, to form alliances with the, with the company, that eventually the company turned on him, stripped him of his wealth, stripped him of his power, and he finished his life in poverty. Although the company leadership, the year 17, condemned Governor van der Stel's actions, the damage had been done. His life is a, an illustration of, I suppose, that one of the options available to the Khoi was collaboration rather than resistance, and, and his life story really uh, shows the futility of collaboration. But later, Trading expeditions by settlers often deteriorated into cattle raids. One of the most callous attacks happened in the Eastern Cape. They did horrific things to the Khoi, Khoi and San clans, owners of livestock, to the extent that Simon van der Stel put a ban on the trade in livestock between the Khoi Khoi and the Freeburgers. This area was called Bakleiplatz, or site of fighting, because of skirmishes between the Dutch and the Khoi Khoi. By 1769, the once wealthy Hesequas that traded with the Dutch here possessed hardly any livestock. The Landtrost of Stellenbosch reports that the Khoi Khoi society is already in disarray and disintegrating in the southwestern Cape before even the smallpox epidemic. And he attributes this largely to incursions by violent colonists. He mentions one character in particular he calls Dronke Gerrit, and I think the name says it all. Uh, Dronke Gerrit was a, was a man who turned to violence to basically rob uh, the Khoi Khoi of their livestock. And one can imagine that he wasn't alone. He probably had huntlungers and they had muskets and were a pretty formidable force. 
There was a huge increase in the demand for meat and, um, uh, and, and produce. So they had to also acquire large amounts of cattle from the last remaining uh, independent Khoi Khoi tribes. The commando system was used effectively to coerce these tribes to trade with the Dutch. Once the Khoi Khoi lost their cattle, they had very few options except to either become laborers for the new class of company settler who was finding it was much easier to be a cattle farmer or a sheep farmer than it was to be an agriculturalist. The few remaining Hesekor kraals were under constant threat from land-hungry farmers moving in from the Cape. Professor Russell Fulhoun did extensive research into a case of land dispossession in 1787. A farmer named Johannes Nicholas Swart displaced a whole community of Khoi Khoi under Captain David Valentine, close to Rafir Sonner End. The Cape governor condemned the land invasion, yet nothing was done about it. But in the background, there was this young, up-and-coming person called Jan Parl, who was part of that community, saw the, what I see as injustice, and he wanted to do something about it. And he saw himself as this prophet called Onsilive Year, meaning that with the help from God, the Dutch on the 25th of October would be driven from the Cape, and the Khoi Khoi people would be restored the rightful owners of the country, South Africa. Jan Perl was born in 1761 near present-day Swellendam. His mother was a Hesequa and his father possibly a Dutch farmer. Despite not fully recognized in South African history, he dared to challenge the very heart of the Cape establishment. He was a visionary, a rebel, a free thinker and a restless spirit that refused to accept his station in life dealt to him at birth. We wanted to get back his, his land from, from colonial rule in a very unusual way. A movement which lasted several months evolved and unfolded, which uh, um, caused quite a lot of um, trouble with, with the Cape. He had about 200, 200 supporters comprising slaves, Khoi Khoi, aggrieved people of Khoi descent. But I think what happened was that there were internal strife within what we could call a movement. Information leaked to the local authorities that large arms caches were, were, were stored in, in certain Khoi Khoi kraals, um, assegais, um, bows and arrows to be used to launch their attack on, on the colonial farmers in the region. The information that led to where the colonial officials led by the Fanol Onkret could then defuse in a way the rebellion, um, in a way where it, uh, where it came to naught. According to some historians, after reaching the Hari, one group of Khoi Khoi herders moved west towards the cold Atlantic, and here they split into two. One group headed into Namibia, and the other south into what today we call Namakwaland. Centuries later, they will re-establish contact with the Cape Khoi Khoi when clans crossed into the Oliphants River heading north to escape colonial rule. For centuries, the territory between the Oliphants River in the south and the Kharib in the north was occupied by the little Namakwas. The group across the river 
in present-day Namibia was known as the Great Namakwa. The Namas is one of the few tribes of Khoikhoin that remained largely intact as a group. Today, people live in reserves which developed around the mission stations. We're in Leerlifontein, the southern part of Namakwaland, and I'm joined by Florence Fulton, a cultural activist, storyteller, writer, poet, and she was born and bred in Leerlifontein. <laughs> Actually, Jolene, I was born and bred in Temis. Temis, that is how it's originally called by the Khoi people. It was baptized Temis. Voor Leerlifontein. Voor Leerlifontein. Well, okay. Voor, voor Leerlifontein. In hoe het die mense hier gesettel? Hoekom? Soos jy kan sien, baie vrugbare grond, waterrijk. In die valleie en klove rondom die Leerlifontein is baie water en dit was een ideale beskitte plek. Vertel my van die pre-koloniale geskiednis van die Leerlifontein of Timmies. Ja, Timmies, lang voor die komst van Wanne was Sean 1816, het die kooi hulle reeds hier ingeburger in hierdie plek. Hulle het die Timmies genoem, soos ek reeds gesê het, en dit beteken die plek van samenkomst. So hier was een hele aantal name hutte. Hulle het daar ingewoon, dit was hulle plek waar hulle geblei het, Reg rond om Lelyfontein was daar een klipmier, een hoog klipmier gepak. En ek het by die ouwe mense gehoor, hierdie klipmier, die doel daarvan was om die dieren, hulle, hulle dieren uithou. Want hulle het baie beeste, hulle het beeste gehad, hulle stap gehad, hulle was in vandagse terme eindelijk rijk mense. En daar was reg hulle kleren draag, hulle het maar velkarosse gedraag, wat hulle geëet het was vlees, en veldkoos, wortels en bessies en plante uit die veld het. Hulle het op die stadium nie brood geëet nie. Hulle het ook nog nie groente geëet nie. Dit was dinge wat later gekom het. Maar hulle het, hulle het geweerd van een godelikheid. Hulle het een god gehad, the great one in the sky, wat hulle kooi goe heb genoem het. En, maar dit was wel een probleem, want hulle kon hom nie sien. Hulle het hom net gehoor in die donder. En, en daar was een begeerte by hulle om meer uit te vind van hier die God van die van die van die van die land. Today, things have not changed much in Lilifontein. The reed mat huts made way for modern structures, but we can still see goat and sheep herders living a semi-nomadic lifestyle, just like their forefathers. This stock post is about five kilometers from the village. In keeping with tradition, these herders live with their herds in temporary structures and prepare their meals in cooking shelters. During the winter months, they will move again even further away in search of better pasture and wherever it's warmer. This pasture rotation has helped to preserve the land from overuse. Okay. Most of the land around them has been claimed by commercial farmers and they need more land to sustain their herds. At first, colonialists left the Namas alone, but the opening of the cattle trade started a new wave of expansion. By the 1770s, white trekboers started moving in, leading to new conflict over land. The new stock farmers acquired land through the loan farm system. The farmers fenced in large tracts of land near watering holes, and the Khoi Khoi herders were forced onto reserves and mission stations. Deep in the northwest, we find the mission station Steinko. The original Nama settlement was about five kilometers south at a place with an interesting name, Besondermeid. Besondermeid. Dit is eindelijk 
die vertaling van een nam naam kar karakois nie, wat betekent een uitzonderlijke of een bijzondere vrouw. Uh, daar is die sending weer begin die Duitse sending van die Rijnse sending genootskap uh, wat die gemeente begin het rondom 1817. Sy naam was Johan Heinrich Schmielen. Hy het later aan het hy getrouw met een inheemse vrouw wat ook van die Steinkoff gebied afkom sig was, een namme vrou. Ons het daar geken as Anna of Gorgie Meijer, dis die naam wat ons van al die van gehoor het. Maar sy het later een ander naam aangeneem toe sy gedoop was Zara. En sy staan daar, daarom ook bekend as Zara Schmielen vir sommige mense. During her lifetime, and for many years until recently, Zara never got the recognition for translating the Bible into Nama. During the late 1700s, Khoi Khoi of mixed origin called Bastards and Bastard Hottentots started moving north and assimilated with the Nama population. They were called Orlams, meaning clever people. Many had white fathers. They had horses and guns, and some adopted the Christian faith. Oma Saraji Bali, as she is known, is a direct descendant of an Orlam captain Abraham Vigeland. Apparently, he was anointed by the influential captain Kiddo Vudboy as captain over the Steinkop region. Abraham Vigeland, at 1803, 1803, het hy weer gekom in die land. En hy het die oom man daar oor kan kom gekryf, want hy mag nie. Hy alert met sy rui goed hard, en hy het gestap. Toe kom hy eerst in besonderheid van die kaap af, en hy geloop. Hy soek plek om te sit met sy mense sam. Hy het baie mense gehad, namers. En dan, hy het weer sy kooi kooi, die oom man. Hy leid hier. Hy het die wereld omgegaan. Hy het een oos gehad wat hy opgeraai het. Nie een oos, nie een koei wat merk had. Hy het hy die land omgepatrooli. En daar waar hy moog is, wat hy bykie wil rus, dan merk hy die koei en hy drink die merk. Ik zie de weg op. Toen ik de weg op daar gezet als ik op het van het kleine land. En ik zei, hier moet jij zeggen, ik ga het voor doen. Toen hij bellen had gegaan. En ik bellen had gezet. Hier zo, het my opa goed op die ouwe rompje geland, dienst gehou. Want hier was hier kerk in die land gemis. Dit is die eerste posies kerk wat hier gehou is. During the 18th century, a new subgroup of Khoi Khoi, mixed with slaves and European farmers, emerged. They started migrating north into Namakoland in search of land. One influential group was the Griquas, and their founding father was Adam Koch. And who was Adam Koch? There are no official written records to tell us who he was, to give us an accurate idea. Some say he was a cook here at the Cape Castle. He may very well have worked in the governor's dining halls or behind one of those doors in the kitchen. One might never get to the truth because the records are quite patchy and not very forthcoming. But the very first Adam Cock was probably a runaway slave. The name Cock suggests maybe that even he might have been a cook. But whoever he was, he must have been a very remarkable man with great leadership abilities. He managed to unite a diverse group of people, hoi hoi, freed or runaway slaves, and lead them on a quest for freedom. 
This is where it all started for the Griquas, the Picketburg district, about two hours drive north of Cape Town. This was the land of the Khuriqua and the Khrikhikwa, relatively small tribes sandwiched in between the more powerful Kohokwa in the south and the Namas in the north. By the time Adam Koch arrived in this district in 1751, both groups were in an advanced state of disintegration. This is a long story. Um, that is here where Adam Koch the first time gevestigd na he said freed became. En dit is hier waar hij verschillende etnische groepen bij elkaar gebracht heeft. Dit is hier waar ook die ontstaan van vrijheid begint en die gedachte daartoe. En waar Adam Kok verschillende etnische groepen hier als die vrijheid van mensen hier begint. Die eindelijke Rainbow Nation heeft hier begonnen. En dit is van hier af waar mensen besluiten ons gaan een vrijheid leven. En hier is ons vandaag. Die naam van hier plek van tevoren was Kapitein Skloof. Vandaag is dit Bangkok. Dit is hier waar Adam Kok die eerste zijn woning gehad het. Dit is ook hier waar Cornelis Kok die eerste een geboren is. As more and more frontier farmers moved in here, grazing land became increasingly scarce. Adam Cock and his followers, under pressure to find pasture, headed north over the Willifans Rafir into what is today known as the Knersflakte, or the Little Namakwa land. Is this now the path that is going to follow? Yes, for our story, this is the route that was going to follow. Here, over the Knersflakte, over the Kamiskroon, right up to the Pella. And here, 500 kilometers north of Piketberg, we find the Groot Gariep, or the large river. South Africa's own Rio Grande. Today it forms a border between South Africa and Namibia, but in those days there were no such things as borders. And it was in this vicinity that Adam Koch and his followers first settled after their long trek. Cornelius Koch set up a number of cattle posts along the river, such as this one. They came into contact with various other groups, such as the Koranas. And so when the missionaries came to that part of the world, of course they were going to work through the cocks. And the cocks actually saved and supported the missionaries on a number of occasions by advancing them loans, giving them wheat, giving them livestock. They were quick to adopt Christianity, uh, quick to adopt colonial culture. But at the same time, they knew enough about colonial culture to want to avoid it and put a healthy distance between them and the colony. So many Meselaar, we are now al vier dagen op die pad, en ons is uiteindelijk hier so op Philippolis. Ja, uiteindelijk Rihanna, ons was per voertuig op die pad. Die Griek was het te voet en te ossema getrek. Adam Pop III became chief in Philippolis in 1837. Voortrekker farmers started moving into the area, distancing themselves from British rule in the Cape. They ignored Griqua rights to the land and increasingly appropriated the best grazing land and water fountains. This is the main street of Philippolis and I'm here with local Griqua guide Charles Himan. Philippolis is a town rich in history but very little of its Griqua past is visible here. That's true. Maar dit is alles as gevolg van die Europeers. Hulle het die Griekwa geskiedenis hier weggevat van Philippolis. Maar toch kry ons nog steeds rijke gebouwe en erfenis van die Griekwa hier in Philippolis. Soos Adam Kok se huis. Dit is die huis van Adam Kok die derde. As ons kyk na hierdie huis, dan gaan ons sien die oorspronklike muur, soos u kan sien, is veel dikker 
als die gewone mens soos hy is. Die vensters kan een mens ook sien, die is die oudste huis in Philippolis. Gradually, the Griekwas lost control over the land and eventually they had no choice but to sell the remaining land to the Free State Boers. The Griekwas gathered their belongings and tracked over the Drakensberg to an area called Normansland, promised to them by the British. This is Ongeluksnek Pass, where Adam Cock III cut across these magnificent mountains known as the Drakensberg. It was a migration of epic proportions, relegated to a footnote by South African historians. Adam Cock III led 2,000 of his followers with 300 ox wagon and 20,000 head of cattle and sheep across these mountains from Philippoulis. After losing nearly half their livestock and their ox wagons in the ravines of these mountains, they arrived at their promised land. But the trek cost them dearly. Despite the odds, the Griqua settlement survived for a decade before they were annexed by the Cape government. Today, many Griquas are still bitter about the betrayal of the British when they lost their diamond-rich land to the Boers in the Free State. Our land is stolen by the British people. They're sitting with our diamonds also there. They they're so rich today and they sold it and because our people was not educated. They didn't have lawyers and everything. The Griqua symbol of the Kanidot aloe plant embodies the spirit that kept them alive despite all odds. Colonization and the policy of apartheid created further dislocation and a diaspora that threatened their continued existence. Today, they are scattered all over the country, but they remain a proud, independent and united people wherever they find themselves. Against all the odds, they have survived. They refuse to be labeled colored and brushed aside. Nine July, 1737, Cape Town Harbor. A young former butcher's apprentice from Germany, George Schmidt, steps ashore. His mission, to preach the gospel to the indigenous people. He was sent by the Moravian Missionary Society at a time of evangelical revival in Europe. But the Cape was not a friendly place for this missionary. The spiritual monopoly was held by the Dutch church and although he came with VOC permission, local clergy and farmers did not approve of his intended teachings to the Khoi Khoi. Schmidt arrived in the Overberg and first started teaching to the Hasequas who lived near the company cattle post. A year later, on the 23rd of April, 1738, he arrives in Bavianskloof, the present-day Genadendal, where he continued his work. In 2018, Moravians in Genadendal commemorated 280 years since his arrival and his work as a pioneer, making it the oldest mission station in Southern Africa. Uncle Chris, as the historian of the church, can you tell me about today's event? Yes, so we are celebrating the arrival of George Schmidt, the Moravian missionary from Germany in 1737. He arrived here actually in Table Bay on the 9th of July. And now we are celebrating this. It's 280 years ago. And that was the beginning of our church here in this place. And our schools, because uh, George Schmidt also taught the people from the first day. And he also preached to them. After Schmidt left, 50 years passed before the Moravians resumed the mission work. Marsfeld, Schwinn and Kuhnel 
found the original pear tree still standing and they met one of Schmidt's original converts, Magdalene Vehetje, now 81, with her old Bible given to her by Schmidt. Only Vehetje Tukue survived and she kept up the Christian faith by also preaching to other people as the first Khoisan evangelist for about 50 years. And they found her at the pear tree, praying there, when the couple of Moravian missionaries eventually came. After that, they have established the Moravian church there. <laughs> Easter Sunday morning, Moravians worldwide celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here in Gnadendal, it certainly is a deep emotional experience. The significance of this sunrise service dates back for many, many centuries. It started with the founding of the Moravian Church in 1457 in Moravia, Bohemia, today the Czech Republic. We celebrate this every Easter morning, although the early Christians celebrated it every Sunday morning at sunrise. The congregation walk from the church square towards the village graveyard, about 20 minutes away, led by the brass band. Die lam van God, waar die zonde van die wereld wegneem. Hij het gelei onder Pontius Pilatus, is gekruisig, gestorven en begrawe, en het neergedaal na die dode reik. Hij het op die derde dag opgestaan uit die dode, en met hom baie lichame van die ontslapen heiliges. It's an emotional experience for many as the names are read of loved ones that have passed on since the previous Easter weekend. Sarah, Margaret, Klute, Willena, Joy, Michaels, Joy, Samantha, Phyllis, Caroline, Margaret, Ockers, Stella, Abrams, Anna, Cornelia, Kleinsmith. By the early 1800s, more than a thousand people were living in Gnadendal, making it the second biggest town after Cape Town. By the mid-1800s, the population grew to more than 3,000 and several industries were established. Gnadendal became a thriving settlement, providing a model for other mission stations that followed. But what was the spiritual life of the Khoi Khoin before the arrival of missionaries. Author and researcher Dr. Vila Busa wrote about this in his book, Struggles of an Ancient Faith. And the Khoisan, according to archaeologists and geneticists, are the first indigenous people, not only of Southern Africa, but also on Earth, which means that as Homo sapiens, as the first modern human beings, we had to develop a sense of a higher being. They came over many years, they've developed through evolutionary thinking their concept of God. A God as creator, God of the creator of the rains, God as provider, God as protector, and that was the way they came uh, along with this religious consciousness or, or sacred being that, will, that, that must be there. The Khoi Khoi didn't struggle to become Christians or found it relatively easy to become Christians because of a number of similarities. The very first thing is that we had a monotheistic concept of God, that is, we believed in one God. But critics of the missionaries say they may also have unwittingly contributed to the Khoi Khoi cultural genocide, stripping them of their roots. 
when the missionaries came with their preconceived ideas of the Khoisan faith being uh, heathen, barbaric, and uncivilized, they came with the notion that we should get rid of everything that is indigenous and replace it what they call a full package Christian Western civilization. So you could not receive the hospitality on a safe haven like the missionary station and not let go of your own indigenous culture, faith, customs, traditions, etc. Riley Lof, doop and doop van Jesus, the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it was a price to pay for the hospitality on the mission station and then you became a Christian. But it started with baptism because with baptism, it was totally different from the, the ideas of the first Christian missionaries, uh, St. Paul. What the missionaries in South Africa did was to say, we baptize you, but we don't accept your indigenous identity. You must have a Christian name right from the start. Krakoa became Eva, uh, Achumau became Harry, uh, etc. And the five people who were baptized by uh, Georg Schmidt, Viedgar uh, Tukui, became Magdalena, etc. So you had to let go also of your indigenous identity. After, Kanadendal mission work expanded in the colony. In 1802, the London Missionary Society established its first permanent settlement at Bethelstorp on the eastern frontier. Unlike the Moravians who stayed out of politics, Johannes Theodorus van der Kemp at Bethelstorp led with continued protests against government policies towards the Khoi The year 1799 marked the end of the once mighty VOC and its violent legacy in the Cape. But it paved the way for new oppressive regimes. In 1806, the British took control of the Cape and shortly afterwards, Lord Caledon issued his controversial Caledon Code. Uh, it was a way of forcing Khoi Khoi people into servitude. Um, the Dutch always put forward the, the story that they never ever enslaved the Khoi Khoi. They did not have to because, I mean, they destroyed the Khoi Khoi systems by other means. So much so that, uh, that any Khoi Khoi um, uh, uh, individuals um, outside of their political systems were forced to look for um, uh, labor opportunities by Dutch farmers. The, that, in effect, was um, a form of indentured servitude. So it's just slavery by another name. They passed this piece of legislation because it basically guaranteed to the colonists that the Khoi Khoi would now be an available labor source. The Khoi would be forced to work for the colonists and this would uh, uh, alleviate or ameliorate the, the threatened loss of labor that the abolition of the slave trade uh, was threatening. The Caledon Code was heavily criticized by the missionaries who saw it as being an equivalent to slavery and it was finally repealed by Ordinance 50 of 1828. Dr. van der Kemp, of course, Johannes van der Kemp stands out. He and Dr. John Reed, they fought for the human rights of the indigenous Khoisan people. They put pressure on their own government, the British colonial government, to change the situation of the landless guys. Ordinance 50 never really promised to, to, hand, to hand land back to the Khoi Khoi or to give them economic equality or to give them social equality. All that Ordinance 50 did was maybe give the hint of political equality. Ordinance 50 freed them, but it didn't uh, guarantee either economic security or social equality. The position of Khoi Khoi on settler farms was uh, very often described as being worse than slaves. And generally the Khoi Khoi were, were maltreated, treated worse than slaves, because after all a slave was worth what the slave was bought for, which might be quite a lot of money. 
Whereas the koi koi's labor was only worth, you know, one sheep a year or something like that. ancestry, which for so long has been considered a disgrace, has now become a powerful weapon to claim back land. The notion that the Khoi Khoi and San people, the First Nations of this country, are extinct is as false a notion as can be. The descendants of the Khoi Khoi and San people are still here. Our, our DNA proves it. There is no doubt that the Khoi San people are the First Nations of this country. There should not be systems of restitution or reclamation for the Khoisan. The land is ours. Our genetic footprint has been around for 22,000 years. There is no doubt that the Khoisan people are the first nations of this country. The dispossession of land of the original inhabitants of South Africa, uh, both African and Khoisan groupings, is unden undeniable. Stealing of land did take place. Dispossession is, was fundamental to the building of modern South Africa. It's built into the genes of the society. There is no doubt in my mind that the scenario we have today of white privilege is based on white expropriation of African land and resources. And all we are saying now that is overdue is that we need to reverse this. The Dutch and British colonists should be held accountable for this and they should make reparation to the descendants of the Koko and San people in this country for the atrocities that was caused by, the, the, by um, not, not in essence colonialism, but the, the practices associated with colonialism. Despite the loss of their traditional culture and language, the Khoi Khoi descendants survived, and today they celebrate the arrival of the first missionaries who offered them places of refuge and hope. Today marks 210 years and 12 days since the first church service was held here. And today, the Mamri Moravian church community have returned to where it all began, under the poplar trees in Loeskloof. It's not only a celebration of their Christian history, but also remembering and celebrating their rich Kohokwa roots. Saudere, amase, 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 amase. Today, they have developed a unique cultural identity, and many continue to recognize their undeniable Khoi Khoian roots. While many descendants of the Khoi Khoi and San are reclaiming their rich history, language and culture, the very emotional issue of land or stolen land remains. For them, like Sarah Bartman, it is time to go home. Come to take you home where the ancient mountains shout your name. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buchu and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white. I've come to take you home where I will sing for you. For you have brought me peace. For you have brought us peace.